Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out, and in the video today, we're looking at how Laserdisc ultimately won the format wars. And just before we get started, I do want to say that this video is brought to you by TunnelBear. TunnelBear helps people browse a more open internet, privately and securely. To try TunnelBear for free, go to tunnelbear.com slash brainfood. On January the 14th, 2009, Laserdisc officially died. Of course, the shiny 12-inch optical disc that once competed with VHS and Betamax in the home video market spun into oblivion long before that. However, it was that Wednesday in January of 2009 that Pioneer, the last remaining company to make the devices, declared they were ceasing production after making a final run of 3,000 Laserdisc players, bringing the total made to just under 17 million units. Under the market environment in which new media such as DVD and Blu-ray discs now dominate, it has become difficult for Pioneer to procure the parts required to produce LD players. This is from Pioneer's press release on the subject. Consequently, Pioneer has been forced to terminate production of its LD products. For the three decades that Laserdisc was on the market, it earned a reputation for providing much higher picture quality, better audio, and laughably superior navigation than its competitors. From all this, the fact that VHS won the showdown is counterintuitive at first glance. But as with so many things, Laserdisc initially lost the home entertainment format wars, not because of an inferior product, but primarily because of cost. Somewhat bizarrely, Laserdisc can actually very loosely trace its origins back to Bing Crosby. Post-World War II, the crooner was the regular host of certain radio shows. However, he didn't like to do them live, partially because it sometimes required him to do the shows multiple times for different time zones. The alternative he had was to pre-record for later broadcast with shellac discs. But these were brittle, and the playback quality left something to be desired, which resulted in studios generally putting a kibosh on using such recordings for their primetime shows. But Army Corps engineer Jack Mullen offered him a solution – high-quality magnetic tape recording. While magnetic tape recording had been around, before this, the quality of the recordings it wasn't that great. This all changed in 1942 when Dr. Walter Weber and Hans Joachim von Brunmal made a breakthrough within Nazi Germany. The result of their work was later heard by an American stationed in England during World War II, the aforementioned Lieutenant Jack Mullen. During his time working on improving radar and other such technologies, Mullen sometimes worked through the night in his lab at the Royal Air Force facility in Farnborough, England. Unfortunately for him, the BBC stopped broadcasting at midnight, leading him to search for something else to listen to. What he found was a German broadcast of classical music that continued throughout the night. The remarkable thing about this broadcast was that, unlike other recorded programs of the day which generally used some form of disc recording that had various pops and ticks throughout when played back, the audio quality of the German classical music broadcast was such that it sounded like a live broadcast. A curiosity, Mullen mused about whether Hitler was forcing full orchestras of musicians to play around the clock, or whether the Germans had come up with a superior recording technology. After the war, he set about finding out, ultimately discovering that the Germans were using nothing more than a magnetophone, which was a device invented in Germany in the mid-1930s. Unlike the 1930s version that the Allies had known about, however, this upgraded unit used superior tape and, critically, AC biasing rather than DC. In a nutshell, the later improvements essentially smoothed out the unused portions of the audio band on the tape much better than DC biasing, which made for a much cleaner sounding audio track. Recognizing the potential commercial uses of this product, in 1948 Mullins went to Hollywood and demoed his own version of the device. This ultimately came to the attention of Bing Crosby's agent, who brought the equipment to the superstar. One listen, and Cosby was sold. He invested in Mullins' company and started using the device to record his radio shows. While this type of pre-recording is commonplace now, at the time, doing this, rather than broadcasting live in front of a studio audience, was something of a mini-revolution within the industry. Eventually, 3M purchased the technology and spun it off to a new company called Mincom. While 3M's Mincom appreciated audio recordings, what they were really looking for was to take the lead in another medium, and that was video recording. David Paul Gregg claims he first envisioned the idea for a video recording optical disc in 1958 while working as an engineer 
engineer for Westrex, a rival of Mincom. Taking the principles of audio recording to a shellac disc, encoding FM signals through a series of pits and ridges, he added a concentrated light source, a laser, for reading the information off the disc. Fired from Westrex in 1960, purportedly for being unwilling to fully share his ideas with the company, Greg and his optical disc idea found a home at Mincom. In 1961, Greg patented his electron beam recording and reproducing system, but still ran into a dispute with his new employer, reportedly for the same reason as his old, his unwillingness to give up control of his invention. Unfortunately for Greg, other Mincom engineers began to take components of what he was working on, creating their own prototype. By 1969, Mincom owns 19 patents for such a device, only three named Greg as a co-author, and was essentially out-innovating the inventor. Greg subsequently left the company to start his own, later selling his Laserdisc patents to MCA. Now let's flash forward six years. With television firmly entrenched, the next step for the entertainment business was bringing Hollywood movies from a dark theater to American homes. Previously, watching movies at home on demand was pretty much something only the most elite in society could do. Towards this end, in 1975, Sony debuted Betamax, and a year later, JVC launched VHS. Betamax had better picture quality, but VHS was lighter, cheaper, and could hold significantly more information than Betamax, at least in the early models. While Betamax and VHS battled in what became known as the videotape format wars, with VHS winning largely owing to major missteps by Sony rather than VHS being the superior format, Magnavox was working on their own in-home entertainment based on the previous work done by Greg at Mincom. This innovation, well, it was called DiscoVision. And no, we're not kidding. DiscoVision essentially just encoded analog data onto a disc, which was read off via a laser. Notably, this new technology had drastically better picture quality and audio quality than both VHS and Betamax. It was also capable of storing multiple audio tracks, which allowed things like director's commentary to be added. The discs for it were also much easier to manufacture, and also in theory cheaper. DiscoVision was first released in December of 1978, and only in one market, and that was Atlanta, Georgia. The player cost $700, which is about $2,300 today. The first movie to be released on DiscoVision, that was Jaws. Initially, the product was a great success, with it selling out all across Atlanta, and this meant that DiscoVision moved on to other markets. In association with MCA, in 1980, Pioneer launched their own version of the player, but dropped the original name for the technology and rebranded it Laser Vision. This is, of course, what ultimately became known as Laserdisc. Investing in making a player that was cheaper to manufacture than Magnavox's, Pioneer managed to get the price for theirs down to about $500, which is about $1,500 today. Getting celebrities like Ray Charles and Mr. Wizard to pitch their product, Laserdisc, well, it was on the upswing. So if Laserdisc was such a superior format, why did VHS become so popular? Well, in many respects, this was for some of the same reasons that Betamax ultimately lost against VHS. To begin with, as previously mentioned, there was the cost. The Laserdisc player was technologically complex and quite bulky, resulting in it being comparatively expensive to make and ship, even if they had sold as many units per year as VHS players. Demonstrating how things might have been different had the player been cheaper to manufacture, in Japan, where the Laserdisc players were heavily discounted for a time, more or less to match the price of VHS players, during that period, Laserdisc outsold VHS, peaking at 1 in 10 households in Japan, owning a Laserdisc player. Another big issue was storage. A standard VHS tape could hold most movies without issue. The Laserdisc, however, it could not. Unlike DVDs and Blu-rays, the Laserdisc stored the video and audio in analog form, though later the audio could be stored digitally as well. The lack of compression in the stored video, combined with the relatively large frame rate, resulted in initial discs only being able to store 30 minutes of video, which was later 60 minutes, per side of the disc. This meant that the movie had to be interrupted frequently to turn the disc over or swap it out for another. After such a flip or swap, it took another 20 to 30 seconds for the half pound, that's a quarter of a kilogram disc, to spin back up to full speed before it would start playing again. However, later models could automatically switch the laser to the other side of the disc. Pioneer even eventually sold multi-disc systems in some designs, such as the laser stack system, swapping out discs not unlike how a record-playing jukebox does. But this all just added more cost to the already expensive system and was completely unnecessary in a relatively cheap VHS, where one tape could hold most movies with no interruption on playback. 
This brings us back to cost and the discs themselves. While technically the laser discs could have been drastically cheaper to make versus video cassettes, being just two single-sided aluminium discs layered in plastic, as the format wars continued to rage and VHS became increasingly popular, the sheer volume of tapes being sold saw the price to manufacture a VHS tape drop to about $1, which is about $2 today. This was happening by the end of the 1980s. On the contrary, one laser disc cost about $5 to make at the time. Because of this, by the end of the 1980s, consumers were paying about $35 to $40, which is about $70 to $80 today, for new release laser discs, whereas a new VHS tape was sold for about $15 to $20, which is $30 to $40 today. Another factor VHS had going for it over Laserdisc was how much easier it was to damage the discs than video cassettes. Now, in theory, a Laserdisc is actually significantly less prone to failing over time than a video cassette, even potentially outlasting a human lifespan, regardless of how many times it was viewed. In contrast, early VHS tapes were prone to relatively rapid degradation in playback quality owing to the fact that the head had to be in direct contact with a delicate tape. All that said, in actual practice, the video cassettes tended to be significantly more durable than laser discs. Accidentally drop a video cassette and it would probably be fine. Do the same to a laser disc, though, and it might result in a scratch. Unlike digital DVDs and Blu-rays, the analog laser disc initially had no really graceful way to deal with such defects. Further, largely due to poor manufacturing of early discs, laser discs were also susceptible to failing due to disc rot. All that said, in places where a VHS tape might be watched countless times, like at schools, with relatively careful handling, the Laserdisc was a far superior format, which is why it was so popular at schools. But for the much larger home use market, where the tapes were infrequently watched, tape degradation really wasn't that much of an issue, especially with later VHS players that could read the tape without the head needing to physically contact it. Yet another significant advantage of VHS was the ability to record shows. While it was technically possible to put such a recording feature into a Laserdisc player, no manufacturer ever chose to offer such a thing, and the discs themselves would have been quite expensive to buy anyway compared with the price of video cassettes. In the end, as VHS continued its rise in market share, Laserdisc rapidly fell off, becoming more of a niche item for video files. These people simply wanted the best picture and audio quality and were happy to bear the cost. Now, you might be wondering what we're going on about because the title of this video is how Laserdisc ultimately won the video format wars, so now you're probably wondering, well, how did they do that? Well, that's via its children, DVDs and Blu-rays, which were all heavily based on the technology pioneered by Laserdisc, albeit in a digital rather than analog form. When DVDs entered the picture in the mid-1990s, they spelled the final nail in the coffin of the essentially already dead Laserdisc. For starters, the DVDs video and sound quality rivaled the Laserdisc, though some video fans would argue otherwise, preferring the analog format, which is why the Laserdisc players continued to be made all the way up until 2009, despite new release movies having long abandoned Laserdisc. Further, thanks to the compressed digital format, among other improvements, a full movie could easily be stored on a single side of a much smaller disc. And it wasn't just the discs that got smaller either. Technological advances combined with the diminished discs allowed for a much more compact, relatively cheap player. In the end, VHS won the battle, killing the laser disc off, but its offspring soon avenged its parents by killing VHS and in doing so, winning the war against the video cassette format. And now for a bonus fact. Just as surprising as the fact that you could still buy a new Laserdisc player in 2009, Sony didn't stop selling Betamax players until 2002. Moreover, you could still buy brand new Betamax tapes up until March of 2016. Ah, the times of Laserdisc when Seagate released a sweet 5 megabyte hard drive, the floppy disk drive was introduced by Sony, and certainly a time when you didn't have to worry about internet security. Sadly, today companies have access to a whole lot more than 5 megabytes of storage, and they're filling up that storage with information about you and your browsing habits online. Bad times. But you can make this year the year you get serious about your internet browsing using TunnelBear. TunnelBear encrypts your traffic and routes it through the TunnelBear network, preventing companies knowing what you're up to on the internet. Not only that, but it can also make it look like you're browsing from another country, which is pretty cool. No more geographic restrictions. You can try TunnelBear for free when you visit tunnelbear.com forward slash brainfood. And as always, Thank you for watching.